and then you have this guy which has a laser pointer here, okay. and then the clicker, or you can just use the, the mouse. Yeah. Okay. Okay, as you're getting your lunch, let's go ahead and get started. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Philip Binkley, um, who is a candidate for the chair of the Department of Medicine. Um, among Dr. Binkley's important leadership roles include um, being the James Overse Overseat Chair of Cardiology, Professor of Medicine, Interim Chair of Medicine, Associate Dean for Faculty Development at Ohio State University. Um, he is a Buckeye through and through, having done his medical school, residency, cardiology fellowship, and all of his professional um, um, activities at Ohio State University. He's, a, he's the Director of Cardiovascular Research in the Department of, in the Division of Cardiology at Ohio State and has a distinguished track record of NIH and American Heart Association funded translational and basic research, particularly in mechanisms of congestive heart failure. Also of note, he is the director of the Center for Faculty Advancement, Mentoring, and Engagement, and is actively involved in faculty development. The title of this talk is, Can We Cure Dilated Cardiomyopathy? Um, please welcome Dr. Binkley. Thank you. Thank you for that, that great introduction, and thank you all for being here, and thank you for having me here at this uh, fantastic institution. I, this is my second visit, and I'm, it's great to see some of you that I've uh, got to meet before and during this visit, and uh, I hope we have a good uh, discussion over the next uh, few minutes on, on this topic. Uh, and, and I have three reasons, at least, that I like talking about this topic. And also, I've got to mention uh, my we didn't want to say old, my, my longtime colleague and friend, Dr. Dunlap, I'm glad I've gotten to meet here also. Uh, there's several reasons I like to give this talk. First, I think it's an interesting topic. Why, why do people improve? Can, can we actually improve LV function and cure dilated cardiomyopathy? Secondly, I think it's a, an example of if you stay around medicine long enough, and maybe you've all, some of you have already been around that long, how you see dramatic changes in the natural history of diseases and evolution of treatment. So I think it's fair to say when Dr. Dunlop and I started out, we would rarely see somebody who would go from an ejection fraction of 20% to normal. Uh, every now and then you'd see that, but it was rare. And now, as we'll talk about, we see that much, much more frequently. And, and why is that? And it's really creating a new natural history of a disease process, and I think that's one of the, the exciting things about medicine. Uh, if you stick with it all these years, you see some pretty amazing things. And the other thing is that I think it's a good example of how a clinical observation uh, can lead to uh, significant research projects. And one thing I, I worry a little bit about as I talk to uh, our fellows, residents, and junior faculty uh, Dr. Dunlap and I had uh, mentors who, uh, it was very difficult to go into a patient room with my mentor and not come out with about a dozen research questions or interesting observations and, and, and really stimulated you to think about what kind of uh, investigations you could do. Uh, I'm worried and I'm, there's nothing wrong with evidence-based medicine or guidelines, but I worry sometimes that uh, we can't just follow them and uh, extinguish our curiosity. And I worry sometimes we've lost some of the mentors who make us think that way. And so I think this is an illustration of how you can start with a, a clinical observation and really grow an important research question. So. Just by brief background, most of you, I think, know that what we call dilated cardiomyopathy is due to ischemic heart disease. Its second most common cause is hypertension. Uh, we believe now that as many as 20% of patients with 
non-ischemic cardiomyopathy may have this on a genomic or hereditary basis. And of course, in medicine, we like to use the most complicated terms we possibly can, so we call a lot of these just idiopathic cardiomyopathy. Uh, I had one of my patients once tell me she was told she had that idiotic cardiomyopathy. I think that's probably as good a term as anything else. Uh, it's prevalent. It's only the only cardiovascular disease that's increasing in this country, and because, despite the advances we're making, still a high mortality disease. So again, when I started out, we thought, well, somebody had reduced heart function, we'd try to treat them, but you know, we're never going to see things get better. But in fact, we're now seeing a significant proportion of patients who improve LV function to normal or almost normal. Now, historically, this is one of the first hints that we had that this could happen. This is one of the uh, older uh, heart uh, mate devices. This is an article in one of the Minneapolis papers that talked about a person who uh, had a ventricular assist device in place. Uh, and again, this is one of the real old pneumatic heart mate devices we don't use anymore. And they found that the, the patient's heart function improved to normal. And in fact, they were able to take the device out and they did fine. And there were lots of theories as to why this might have happened. Did we unload or take the load off the ventricle for a long enough period of time that uh, the ventricle could recover itself? But at least started the discussion that this could be something that would happen. This is my own personal story. And uh, this is Carla Bailey. And uh, we don't need to worry about HIPAA rules uh, here because Carla's been very forthcoming about her history. Uh, Carla was admitted to our hospital uh, to wait transplant, was placed on intravenous dobutamine, and that was in an era where we could not send her home with dobutamine and an ICD and preserve her status one transplant ranking. So she waited and waited and waited. And uh, she's from a very prominent uh, family in the community. So there was lots of press about her story whenever we got a possible heart transplant. Uh, television trucks would show up and reporters. And, and she never, never got that transplant. And for some reason, I really don't remember, after about six months, we thought, well, let's remeasure her heart function. And it was normal. And we thought, well, that's really something. And we thought, well, maybe we're just, uh, maybe she's just really responding to the positive inotropic drug dobutamine. So we gradually, carefully weaned that off, and her heart function stayed normal. And so it was very gratifying, the fact that there was so much press, because we were able to watch on the television uh, as they covered her going home uh, to her children who didn't know she was coming home and it was at Christmas time and coming to stay and it was just really a very wonderful fulfilling story to all of us. Uh, side side uh, effects of that, uh, Carla's church had had a prayer service for her the night before we measured her heart function that returned to normal and she felt the power of prayer uh, improved her heart function. So as a result, I got to be interviewed on the faith-based program, the 700 Club, and I was also interviewed on Montel Williams. So, uh, so every now and then you get some unexpected consequences. But you know, it's just a, it was a great personal story. So the, the story continued. What about the ventricular assist devices? So this was a small study that nevertheless appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine and was a study where there was a very aggressive effort to take patients who had left ventricular assist devices, treat them with a variety of agents, and get them to the point that they could remove uh, the ventricular assist device. There, again, a small group, 15 patients, and this is part of their treatment regimen. 11 of the 15 recovered heart function sufficiently to have a device removed. One died within 24 hours due to ventricular arrhythmias, and keep that thought in your mind because it's something we'll come back to in a few moments. 
One died uh, due to lung cancer, and uh, there was freedom from recurrent heart failure in 100% of the patients at one year. So again, establishing this concept that perhaps, despite uh, in the setting of very reduced heart function, we can, in different ways, normalize heart function. So I'll skip over that. And this was the in the New England Journal, sort of a concept diagram of how this would happen of the forces. Now, you know, I'm from Ohio State, so we like to do everything in sports analogies. So people would say this starts out in a normal football-shaped heart, and as we uh, supposedly remodel the ventricle, it becomes like a basketball. I don't know if that's some kind of comment on which sports are our strongest, but <laughs> but uh, but the idea is here's this downward spiral, but can we in interfere with that spiral some way so that we get people back to this kind of normal uh, football-shaped ventricle? And how frequently does this happen? Well, this is a graph uh, from uh, a trial called the IMAC trial. This is a trial that used intravenous immunoglobulin uh, to test whether that could improve heart function. There have been some smaller studies suggesting that by interfering with inflammatory mechanisms, we might be able to do that. It was a neutral study, but it was largely a neutral study because standard therapy with beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and diuretics led to improvement in injection fractions uh, greater than 40%. If you add this up and count the dots, it's almost 40% of their subjects. So it showed even at that early stage, this is not an unusual phenomenon in the era of current medical therapy. But it still begs the question, not 100% of people did. So who are the patients who are going to really improve heart function? And in my clinic, we started seeing patients more and more frequently that we get a repeat echo and suddenly their heart function is normal. And, you know, it's really exciting to see that and then stimulated the question, well, are there things that we can see that will identify the patients that actually regain heart function to that extent? So in our clinic, uh, we identified uh, 53 patients prospectively that started out with low ejection fractions and improved to 40% or greater. And then the part of so part of this talk also illustrates experimental design questions. We need a control group, and how do we pick the control group? Uh, so we looked at patients who were in the clinic at the same time historically with uh, the patients who recovered, and but how do you match that control group? And that gets into uh, the, uh, the, to the question of you know how do you design adequate matching. Uh, so as an example, when I did a preliminary analysis, uh, somebody asked me, well, are women more likely to recover than men? Well, I couldn't tell them because I'd matched on gender. So that's a common problem in experimental design. As soon as you match on a variable, you've taken it out of the ones you can interrogate as being associated with your, your variable of interest. So we did a technique called frequency matching, which means that uh, you t that uh, if 25% uh, of the patients who recovered started out with an ejection fraction of 20 to 25%, and 25% of the control group had to start out with an ejection fraction of that range. So that isn't, avoids the problem of so-called overmatching, where you match variables out of uh, analysis, but still keep the groups relatively similar. So we, you know, then uh, identified clinical variables that we thought would be, uh, you know, likely to be associated with uh, improvement. We did uh, stepwise logistic regression uh, modeling, and doc, like Dr. Dunlop is doing now, I'm currently, I in the past did an MPH, so I had all these new uh, statistical skills to play with, and. Uh, use this modeling process to identify variables that are independently uh, associated. And remember, we can only say associated because this is really a retrospective data. This is not a prospective cohort study. 
And we'll come back to why that's important in a minute. Uh, interestingly, there are some times in, in your scientific career that the numbers just work out so well you can't believe they're true. So in our matching uh, efforts, we actually matched both our control group and our group of interest to uh, even the same single decimal point standard deviation. So we did a good job of matching. Uh, the covered group increased their EF to a mean of 55%, and the control group increased, but only to 22%, and was significantly less than the increase in our in group of interest. It's important to think about the observation period here. So actually, those in the recovered group had an observation period of around 40 months, and the control group 53 months. So that avoids the problem. You can say, well, you didn't follow the control group long enough, so uh, you know you didn't really you didn't detect their improvement. So they actually were improved uh, or followed for a longer period of time. So this is a list of uh, the initial variables that we looked at to try to uh, understand what might be associated with this degree of remarkable improvement of LD function. Uh, and this is what you do in a logistic regression modeling process. You start out looking at the individual variables, and then you keep adding them one at a time, the most significant one first, the next one next, and until you run out of variables that are adding significance to the model. And so when you do this, this is what we found out as the variables associated with uh, recovered LV function. Gender, so women are more likely to recover heart function, and this is with medical therapy alone, not biventricular pacing or other interventions. Etiology, if you have ischemic cardiomyopathy, you're less likely to recover heart function. QRS duration, so the longer the QRS duration uh, of the patient, the less likely they are to recover normal heart function. And interestingly, the higher the baseline systolic blood pressure, the more likely you were to recover LV function. Now, it's important whenever you do a modeling process like this and you identify variables, you can't just accept them at face value. You have to decide, <clears throat> do they make sense? I mean, are they, they things that you, you can support as possibly having an impact on, in this case, recovery of LV function? So what about gender? So we know from a variety of studies that women tend to do better with heart failure in terms of survival than men. These are data from an older trial called the CEBUS trial, and uh, that seemed to be clearly the case. Uh, and this is just, these are just survival curves with uh, women and men, and, uh, and again, showing the improved survival of women. These data are from Framingham population data, and again, women seem to survive longer with dilated cardiomyopathy than, than men. So I think if you can, you can associate the survival data with uh, the propensity to recover normal heart function, gender makes sense. What about etiology and ischemic heart disease? Well, these are data from uh, Dr. Felker a number of years ago. What he did was look at different classification schemes of what really defines ischemic cardiomyopathy in terms of number of vessels that uh, are involved. And uh, he found that if you had only one coronary artery involved with cardiomyopathy, your survival was almost as good as non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So again, uh, kind of implying that if this is related to survival, then uh, it also makes sense that you'd have a greater chance of recovery with a lesser amount or no coronary artery disease. QRS duration on the EKG. Uh, it's interesting, the mean QRS duration in the covered group was 98 milliseconds in the control group that did not recover, it was 120 milliseconds. This was another interesting number for us because currently uh, our cutoff in general for thinking about biventricular pacing 
is a QRS duration of greater than 120 milliseconds. So it was very interesting that our non-recovered group on medical therapy alone had a longer QRS width, and in fact, in the range where we usually start thinking about biventricular pacing. These are data from one of my mentors, Dr. Don Unverford, who years ago looked at different factors that seem to be associated with prognosis in cardiomyopathy, and interestingly enough, he found that the most significant factor was left ventricular conduction delay or the QRS width. So again, echoing what we seem to be seeing, and in fact, as many of you know, the whole principle behind biventricular pacing is that we're trying to correct the, uh, the, the dyssynchrony of the ventricles that occurs with wider QRS complexes or left bundle branch block. And I like to point out that some of this original baseline data that suggested that you actually have the effect of what they called intraventricular asynchrony came from Ohio State with a lead author being Cindy Grimes, who's uh, gone on to actually have a fabulous career in interventional cardiology. She lost her way and didn't stick with heart failure. But, um, uh, but I think, you know, this is the basis for a lot of uh, biventricular pacing. And again, supports, you know, makes sense. Well, that's why QRS duration. Diabetes, uh, again, lots of data that show that unfortunately in the presence of diabetes, patients do less well with cardiomyopathy. There's um, this uh, from the so-called DEST trial, uh, whether you have coronary artery disease or just dilated cardiomyopathy, if you have diabetes, unfortunately, you do not do as well. And of course, then that supports, I think, our finding if you had diabetes, you had a lower chance of recovering normal heart function. Finally, systolic blood pressure. The higher the blood pressure at baseline, the more likely you were to recover heart function. Again, this is kind of interesting because my uh, mentor, Dr. Lear, and I always used to say, well, if a patient has a blood pressure of 125 and they have heart failure, it has to be hypertensive heart disease because, you know, you can't generally generate a blood pressure that high unless it's hypertensive heart disease. So we were really uh, amazed to find, again, that 125 millimeters of mercury seemed to be the cut point between those that recovered and those that didn't. And again, there, there is a literature showing that, uh, indeed, uh, you know, patients who have higher blood pressures do appear to do better and recover more, the thinking being that partly maybe this is hypertensive cardiomyopathy, and I think we've learned in those patients, especially if we control their blood pressure early on, we can see some pretty remarkable improvements in LV function. And also, if you can generate a pressure like this, you may have a significant degree of myocardial contractile reserve. Your heart may be reduced in function, but maybe still has a function that can gain. Now, I pointed out, want to point this out because, again, I think this is an important point in interpreting uh, data. When we looked at our univariable analysis, beta blockers were actually associated with a lower likelihood of recovering LV function, which is kind of weird because we know that now beta blockers are some of our fundamental therapy for uh, heart failure. But this, again, is an illustration of why you need to be very careful in looking at retrospective data because you can't look at causality in a retrospective study. And so I think what happened in this case, some of these patients were still on the fringe of where we had accepted beta blocker therapy as standard therapy for heart failure patients. So those of you who aren't as old as I, we don't remember that we used to think beta blockers were extremely dangerous in heart failure and we should never give them. And there were a number of studies that needed to be performed to show how to give them and how they could be efficacious. And so we were in an era where maybe only the patients who were really the sickest were clinicians trying to use a beta blocker. So the reason the beta blocker was associated with worse outcome wasn't because the beta blocker 
but it was confounded by the fact that the beta blocker was being used in sicker patients who were less likely to recover. So I think this is just an important illustration of when you read the data, look at retrospective data, and do your own research, how you have to be very, very careful about how you look at retrospective data. So I'm almost embarrassed to show some of these data with some of the, the experts that are in the room, but these are very preliminary data. You know, we were interested in seeing, well, what about a gene-based causes for improved LD function? So um, we did some candidate gene analysis, uh, picking on uh, different gene polymorphisms that had been associated with outcomes in heart failure. And here are just some of the ones we picked. Uh, uh, my colleague, Wolfgang Sidi, who's an uh, expert in pharmacogenomics, calls this a mom and pop shop analysis, but it's, it's a, a beginning anyway. So we looked at some things like a so-called ACE uh, gene deletion that has been associated, although that deletion, actually, I published with Wolfgang, Wolfgang and some others, we believe there's actually a promoter polymorphism that's really the culprit in this. Some variations in uh, receptors and uh, non, no, a nonsense polymorphism of EMPD that Evan Lowe had actually shown has an impact on survival and heart failure. failure. I'll point out the NOS polymorphism that uh, I'll come back to. Uh, some uh, genes that have to do with oxidant stress uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and actually one gene we were very interested in at that time uh, that had an associated risk for coronary artery disease. So we took these and did the same kind of modeling process that we did for the clinical variables and uh, again looked at each individual variable. These are the different uh, uh, p-values, and I'm going to point out that there's a walled p-value, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Uh, so you can see the different degrees of significance of the different, uh, different polymorphisms. The ones that stood out initially were uh, for manganese superoxide dismutase. I always love trying to say this. Let's see if I can say it. Methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase polymorphism. I said it, okay. And uh, heme oxygenase, which was another gene that a graduate student and I, this is a so-called microsatellite polymorphism. And this is what we came up with. That uh, Interestingly, this AMPD1 polymorphism that, again, Evan Lowe had written about seemed to be associated with recovery. Uh, endothelial nit nitric oxide synthase, and particularly the GT variant of that polymorphism, mm -hmm. MCP1, which is uh, associated with attraction of monocytes, and hemoxygenase, which has an effect on oxidant stress. And at the bottom, here's our final model that puts all of those together with their different mm -hmm. coefficients showing their degree of impact. So it's very preliminary. Uh, but I think gives us some idea that maybe there are different uh, genes that may uh, uh, influence whether somebody is going to recover LV function uh, with medical therapy alone. Uh, and uh, something obviously that's uh, fertile ground for future uh, analysis. Just to show you again, just as in um, you know, our clinical variables, do you, you have to show that these genetic variables would have some reasonable association with outcome. So uh, one of the things our lab has done over the years is look at uh, autonomic function by analyzing what's called heart rate variability. And we did that in a group of patients who did and did not have this uh, endothelial nitric oxide synthase promoter that was associated with reduced heart uh, function or reduced likelihood of heart function. We actually showed that patients with that polymorphism had more autonomic imbalance than those that did not. So is this one of the features, is this a mechanism 
by which this polymorphism is reducing the likelihood of recovery of LV function. We also went ahead because the fact that this was a, uh, a uh, loss of function polymorphism had only really been established in, in model systems. So uh, we actually took heart tissue that we have in a biorepository and showed that indeed it is associated with both reduced mRNA and protein expression in our heart failure patients. So it makes a nice story and some credibility that perhaps at least that polymorphism is really associated with worse outcome and something I think that is ripe for future study. Now, a sidebar uh, about interpreting data. Has anybody read this book or aware of this book? I would highly recommend it to you, even if you are not a biostatistician, maybe even especially if you're not a biostatistician. Uh, Jordan Ellenberg writes, uh, he's a mathematician, he writes articles uh, in a variety like New York, New Yorker, other places about issues in mathematics and statistics and for every, all of us. And uh, he gives a very nice discussion in one of his chapters about small data sets. And his reasoning goes this way. If you're looking for something in medicine that may have a fairly small treatment or effect of any kind, and certainly probably gene polymorphisms fit into that category, and you have uh, a small data set, if you see a large effect size, this may actually be more likely to be an error than real which is a really interesting argument. He actually references somebody who, based on that principle, wrote an article that basically said almost all of our reported data in medicine are erroneous. That caused a lot of uh, consternation, obviously. But it's an interesting idea. And again, what you have to think about when you're dealing with smaller data sets and small effect sizes, uh, are we you know, really, when we see a, a change, or is, is it real? And you always have to think about that with statistics. He also goes into a nice discussion of that gets to looking at uh, negative data, which of course we hardly ever do. We all know that. You can't get a, a negative study published many times. But he uses the illustration of, and the reason I said Wald statistic, uh, Abraham Wald was the biostatistician that uh, did an analysis in a very elegant way that actually tells us something that's pretty common sense. And you may have heard this story. It had to do with bombers in World War II. And uh, the Allies were trying to analyze where did they have to reinforce the bombers so they could uh, sustain an attack better. And they started out looking at the planes that came back, and they were all shot up in their wings. So they thought, well, we've got to reinforce their wings. But Wald did this statistical analysis and said, no, that's not right at all. You have to infer from the data you're not seeing you need to in reinforce the fuselage because you're not seeing the ones that don't come back. And they're getting shot up in the fuselage. So uh, again, it, 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 a really interesting idea. And so the argument that uh, Ellenberg makes is we're not looking, we're not inferring from the negative data from the planes that don't come back. And so we're missing the point probably in a lot of our data. This is very much relevant to Karl Popper, who many feel is the, last, is the greatest philosopher of science in the last century and maybe this century. His, his uh, posture was, we never prove anything. We can only disprove things. And so we kind of circle around the truth and get closer to it by disproving more and more things until we start getting an idea of what's likely true. Again, if we're not looking at reputative studies, studies that are negative, we're not really doing this. So uh, I'm just throwing that out for food of thought. And uh, I've always, I think we've all probably wanted to band together and start a journal of negative results. And uh, I don't know if we can get any funding for that, but we probably need to. So this all comes down finally to, to my question. So we've seen patients with normalized LV function, but are we curing them? Uh, in, in any of you, I don't know if this probably happens to you, Mark, and 
whenever you see somebody like that, one of the first things they ask you is, okay, which of my medicines can I stop now? And I, do you, what do you tell them? I'm interested in your answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll you I, I, so I'll tell you, you okay, I, and I'll explain why as we go along. I tell you, you know, really probably not, and uh, because we really don't know the natural history of this disease, and is your heart really normal, or is it just responding very well to the medicines that you're being given, and I'll go on with some more discussion of that. Do you want to tell me at this point what you say? <laughs> I'm not going to get rid of a beta blocker entirely. No, you. no, absolutely. I mean, and, and I have had a few patients who have, after long discussion, they just really don't want to take medicines. I've reduced doses very carefully following things like BMP, the ejection fraction on an echo, letting me know immediately if they have symptoms. But I'll give you some other reasons that I worry about this. And also, interestingly, even though they've recovered normal or near normal heart function, or at least an ejection fraction out of the range that our current guidelines recommend an ICD, are they at risk for still arrhythmias? And uh, and some of these patients have recovered, and they also have an ICD in. And then the question is, well, can we turn off my ICD? To which you say, <laughs> I'm not going to ask. That's a very complicated question. But or, or when the battery goes out. Or when the battery goes out. So here's here are a couple of case examples. This case example is from um, a, um, a, we actually published a three-case series paper and with this cautionary tale. This was a 35-year-old gentleman with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. He started out with an ejection fraction of 10%. He was treated with an ACE inhibitor and carbidolol. His EF improved to 60%. He's very, exercised very vigorously and monitored himself. He was very frustrated. And of course, with the beta blocker, he could not get to his target heart rate for his exercise regimen. So he was bothered by this. His primary physician or some other physician, when he reported this to him, said, you know, your heart's normal now. Just stop your medicine. So he was admitted three months later to my heart failure service. Originally, we thought he had uh, a pneumonia. Uh, but he came in with cough and shortness of breath, even though he had had a, completed a triathlon one month earlier, and on admission, his ex echo, uh, his EF was 10%. So it had relapsed without his medication. And sadly, we were never able, with medications, ever to get it to improve again. And he actually subsequently has had an LVAD and now is doing well with a heart transplant. So when people ask me this question, patients like this, you know, come to my mind, and are we really curing or not? Um, this is a 30-year-old African-American male who had high, like hypertensive cardiomyopathy. He had an EF of 25%. Uh, we aggressively controlled his blood pressure. His ejection fraction went to 55%. He was asymptomatic on his medications that we did continue. Two months later, uh, he had sudden cardiac death and couldn't be resuscitated. We put ICDs in these patients. I like showing this slide because this is a technique that David Rosenbaum was very instrumental in developing here. Uh, I was telling some people that I think the second time I visited Metro, David had just opened his lab here and uh, was obviously a phenomenal person. And um, the microvote Volt T wave alternans is a test to try to assess for risk for sudden cardiac death. And it has, had, has great negative predictive value. It doesn't have very good positive predictive value. So when we interpret it, we usually talk about non negative tests rather than, you know, there is an inner, inner, inter, in determinant category and positive, but we generally group those, group those together in indeterminate. So we looked at a small cohort of patients who had recovered their normal ejection fraction and did microvolt T-wave alternans, and we compared uh, the 
non-negative number of tests to those that are seen in normal. And we also compared them to a group of dilated cardiomyopathy patients who had not recovered. We looked at 13 patients, again, a small sample size with recovered EF. Four had non-negative tests. And that doesn't sound like a lot until you look at the prevalence of there being a 10% prevalence of non-negative tests in normals. And when you multiply that probability, uh, it is, becomes uh, that, that, that this is P is less than 0.05 different in recovered patients and normal patients. In other words, the proportion of patients who have non-negative tests is much higher than you would expect to see in a group of normal patients. A little bit bothersome. And this is, again, small numbers, a chi-square table, but when we compared non-negatives and negatives uh, to uh, those who had dilated cardiomyopathy and those that were recovered, the, there was no difference in the proportion. Again, very small numbers, caution with that, but I think something that raises uh, some further curiosity to look at. So to, to come back to the, the title of the talk, do we cure heart dilated cardiomyopathy? Uh, probably not. I think there are some people that actually do have recovery of LV function. They may go through a process that's been termed molecular remodeling, which may be close to a cure. But again, this is still a relatively new phenomenon, and we don't know the natural history very well, which makes it difficult for us to advise our patients as to that question they ask. Can I stop my medicine? This is in a letter to the editor that I wrote in JACC, in which I propose that it, does this represent a true recovery from the cardiomyopathic process, or is it in fact a remission, you know, sort of analogous to what we deal with with some cancers? Are we putting patients into cardiomyopathy remission but we're not really curing them. And also in that um, editorial, I, uh, I raised the question, should the current American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology classification of heart failure stage include a new category designating those who have returned to normal cardiac function? And interestingly, about a year after this was written, the new guidelines came out and there is a category of heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, recovered. So in fact, uh, that has been an evolving thought process as we go along. So like most investigations, and good, and hopefully an investigation is what you want to end up with is you have many more questions than you started out. So is the heart muscle now normal? Can we withdraw medications? Uh, are there relapses? And we, I have followed some patients for a long period of time that start to reduce LV function again. Are they at increased risk for arrhythmias? And uh, I've even talked with our EP specialists in the past. Do we do EP testing in these patients? And of course, why do some respond and some do not, which we're trying to get at with the statistical model I showed you, which has to be you know, also in modeling that is the so-called training set. To validate the model, you have to go forward and prospectively test it in a new cohort. We've done a few studies looking at primordial cells, actually in patients who receive statins, and interestingly, we've seen a direct correlation between the increase in primordial cells and increase in ejection fraction. So uh, are they playing a role in this, uh, manipulating or stimulating those cells one way to get at this. So again, many, many questions. I hope this, as I've told you, has illustrated you know, how you can make a clinical observation and start investigating it. Uh, and also, I think there are many, many more areas of investigation into this phenomenon. And you know, the excitement of seeing, you know, for me, and I'm sure for Dr. Donna, it's exciting to me whenever we have somebody in their EF comes back and it's normal now. It's just feels miraculous, and, and so it's fantastic that for whatever ever reason, uh, that's happening to our patients. So thank you so much for your attention and for letting me visit with you, and 
I'd be happy in the time remaining to answer any questions that you might have. So what do you do with the meds, Bill? <laughs> what do we do with the meds? With the meds. Oh, the meds? I, I just have the discussion and I said, you know, we published this case series and uh, it's only three patients, but, uh, you know, I've seen these go back to baseline and they haven't recovered and personally I don't really take want to take a chance. So I pretty much keep them the same. keep all of them at the... Target yep. The target dose. Yep. Yep. Uh, if somebody really is having fatigue or something, I might try to reduce the beta blockers some um, or alter them. But uh, uh, maybe I'm just too squeamish. But I'm I'm worried when, and especially like you know. And of course, it's always not good to refer to just one patient. But that patient example I showed you, I think, is really a cautionary tale and. We had a couple of others that, for various reasons, had their medicine stopped and they just went back. So, you know, in, unless I can prove that somehow this is a completely reversible process, I'm really reluctant to do it. Other questions? Yes. So, that was a great talk. Thank you. Um, so, any patients had alcohol use Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, First, it's again. I'll ask Mark today. What 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 is alcohol-induced cardiomyopathy? I mean, I, I I like it that you've used the term alcohol-induced because many of the studies have shown that you don't really, if you are alcohol sensitive, uh, you really don't have to drink that much alcohol. I, I mean, so calling it alcoholic cardiomyopathy, I think, is a disservice to the patient. I think if you have demonstrated that somebody through a lifestyle modification has improved their LV function, then I feel more comfortable with backing off or eliminating the medications because then I think you do have an identifiable cause. And I actually think that many of the cases I saw when I was a fellow, which were not very many, that improved their LV function probably were alcohol-induced cardiomyopathy. And one of the things that we learned in uh, clinical trials is what we now try to practice in the clinic is that having, in addition to physicians, nursing colleagues, uh, pharmacists watching the patient when they would, so I'd see this in a clinical trial because there was a nurse calling up every day or every other day and asking, you know, how are you doing? What are you doing? You know, having somebody pay attention and be concerned about your health, I think motivates people to start doing good things for their health, and that's why we tried to transfer that research approach to the clinical realm. So in that case, I, I feel a little more comfortable. Yes? Instead of an observation, you see the narrative treatment of the HIV Oh, that's a really interesting uh, yeah, observation, and that, and that you know I showed the you know the IMAC trial, um, which was a neutral trial, but actually there were several smaller trials prior to that that were more mechanistically driven. There was one from Germany that actually showed with uh, IVIG infusions uh, there were reductions in pro-inflammatory cytokines and increases in anti-inflammatory cytokines. And uh, I actually, when that data was, you know, before the IMAC trial that sort of put, uh, you know, deterred us from doing that, I actually had some patients who were on chronic therapy that weren't improving. Of course, we didn't have IV pacers or anything, but I admitted and uh, gave intravenous immunoglobulin too, and I follow several of them uh, today that have normalized their heart function, again, with a small cohort, you know, can't conclude anything from that, but that's a really interesting observation. Yes? How important do you think it may be to normal signs given the system by either means of transurbanics or aggregation? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. We haven't really had strong data despite the fact that there are several studies that, you know, that have looked at whether correcting atrial fibrillation itself will prevent reduction in LV function if you control the rate or not. 
Uh, however, I think we also feel, and I know our electrophysiologists feel, that uh, they've never met anybody, even with a normal heart, who doesn't feel better once they're in sinus rhythm, even though they think they feel fine. Now, that's a subjective a, a, a impression that goes against some of our large clinical trials that shows there's not a great difference, at least in normal heart function, between rate control and rhythm control. But I, I think particularly with reduced uh, LV function, anything we can do to optimize the, the function and improve ventricular filling, um, you know, I think that makes it a, a useful target to restore sinus rhythm. Actually, I didn't think about that. What related to Dr. Dunlap and I were talking about fluid redistribution and with, you know, the auxiliary pump function of the atrium, whether that's a, a factor there as well. That's a great question. I just hadn't thought about that. Have you looked at differences in atrial fib and sinus? That would be interesting to... Yeah, there are some emerging data that even, even well-controlled atrial fibrillation is probably a signal that could continue in the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. But I meant from the fluid shift standpoint that you're looking at. It's really interesting. Good question. Yes. Uh, what is the Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think exercise for sure. And even though we had a very neutral study uh, from uh, what, the study that was uh, centered at Duke on uh, exercise, uh, I think there are smaller studies in many of this field that exercise is probably contributory to maybe an equal extent to our medications. Again, I think we ran into the problem with that study being a very large trial, and I think there were a lot of questions about, even though people were prescribing an exercise regimen, how adherent they really were to it, so it didn't give us the answer I think we really wanted. But we really encourage uh, patients to, uh, you know, especially walking regimens, uh, you know, which walking has been shown, at least from a cardiovascular standpoint, to have equal benefit to jogging or other exercises. So that's probably, now the, the other uh, thing that's interesting is you get into uh, depression or other thing. I did a small study with some investigators in our Center for Alternative Medicine where we uh, had patients in addition to their usual medicines go through uh, a program of mindfulness, meditation, also dietary uh, uh, modifications and uh, actually in a small group showed a reduced readmission rate. We also saw a reduction in measures of fatigue and depression. It was depression. Depression is a whole other topic of, you know, fascination to me because the, the many of the mechanisms that are involved in depression are also operative in heart failure. And it's almost a chicken and egg question. You get into a cycle and which is feeding which. And if you interrupt one cycle, you improve another. But I, I work very closely, and we actually have a working group in depression, anxiety, and heart disease. Uh, Cheryl Carmen, who's a psychologist, who's an expert in anxiety. Uh, I send a lot of patients to her because uh, I think that the evidence, there's some evidence in older patients that even antecedent depression can lead to heart failure. So depression and anxiety is another huge, and, and very often the intervention there is uh, is counseling therapy, not necessarily medication. Thank you all. Thank you.